Hello and welcome to the Face Eater Director Screenwriter's Commentary. I'm John McClure, the screenwriter, and I also played the main character, Flex Crush. Hello, I'm Jared Perrot. I directed, edited, and shot Face Eater. Uh, we are here on the uh, Durango Narrow Gauge Railroad, uh, filming at 3 in the morning because uh, normally this is a very busy street and there are two bars, uh, which he is about to walk past. So we, we decided to film at 3 a.m. just to avoid any possible problems. You'll often see signs like one way going the wrong way in the film, which was uh, metaphorically intentional. And the black and white aspect of this, along with the way Jared shot it, was very intentional in the sense that we wanted to create stylistic and dramatic beginning to pull the audience in. John and I both like the film noir genre and uh, this movie is basically encompasses a lot of different genres and we just kind of wanted every scene to represent a different genre just to keep it entertaining and to keep us entertained as well as the audience. This was one of the first scenes that we shot and we had to practice more with this scene and go back and redo certain things than we did with elements that occurred later on once people got in practice playing their characters and in their roles. Taking so long to answer makes you seem dishonest. Okay, the, uh, the actor playing Frank uh, is Christian Thurkelson. And uh, this shoot took about three weeks to complete. Uh, he had a little bit of difficulty with uh, this line right now. And uh, also, uh, there was, there are, as I said earlier, there are two bars across the street, which uh, did cause noise problems because uh, we did shoot this around, I believe, 8 or 9 o'clock at night. And uh, this in traffic made this shoot uh, especially difficult. Create Frank. Among other difficulties, we had a lot of late night mail checkers that would pull in that would cause us to pause briefly, and also many visits from our fine local police officers making sure why a bunch of guys in dark clothing happened to be lurking at the post office. The sequence you're about to see, which occurs in the car, where Lex takes his revenge, if you will, upon Frank, is actually shot in my driveway across town, although you would never know it from the way Jared has edited it together. You're about to see some lightning flashes uh, across the sky, and though we did have uh, special effects in this film, this is not uh, one of them. These are real lightning bolts, and... Um, the change of season did, pro, did uh, make things difficult for us because the leaves uh, were continually falling off the tree uh, right above where Flex is standing right now. And uh, the last shoot, uh, we did get a rainstorm that knocked all of the leaves off the tree, and we finished just in time. We literally finished shooting five minutes before the hailstorm that knocked all the remaining leaves off the tree and would have completely drenched us and made filming impossible. So uh, between that and getting lucky with the lightning strikes, which is the only way you ever get weather in a film, is by luck, it worked out really well. There's Josh Schoberg pushing the Cadillac back and forth. Can't see him, of course. Another piece of luck here is that as Frank rolls over dead, you can see my eyes in the back seat as the camera auto-focuses. That doesn't always work, but it did in this case. Hit it, Lenny.
Okay, right here you can see Dan uh, picking up Christian. He had done this so many times that he had actually hurt uh, Christian, uh, his ribs. He, he had some sort of cartilage uh, rip in his, in his ribs. So that was uh, Dan carrying uh, his uh, girlfriend at the time through the doorway. And she also plays two different roles in this film as Corman's squeeze, Nancy, and also uh, as Flex Crush's daughter, Lois, in the last scene of the movie. This sequence also begins to show the dark side of Face Eater because with plastic on the floor with a dead body, uh, that can't be leading to anything good. And here we are at the bookcase. We you guys know the routine. filmed quite a bit of material here. Um, for me. John did own this uh, during the majority of the shooting, and it really provided a lot of shit. atmosphere in the movie. Uh, in more ways than than one, but um, it's a it's a cool place. Oh yeah. And I'd like to point out this uh, wonderful soundtrack uh, by Minor. Um, we from the beginning we wanted to go with kind of an '80s uh, John Carpenterish soundtrack, and she pretty much just uh, created her her new material and. I think it's it's a phenomenal soundtrack. She nailed it. It's awesome. Yeah. And this uh, this title sequence was done by uh, my uh, brother Mark Smith at Lightbender Effects. Um, he did all the special effects in this movie and really added a lot to it. And uh, I think it, it wouldn't be as good of a movie as it is, uh, had we not had that option. I think the credits that he created in the special effects combined with minor soundtrack absolutely brought to life the hard work that we struggled literally for three years in the filming and a year in post-production to create. Once in a while, you see that Josh Schoberg guy name show up occasionally, and uh, he did a pretty good job, too. Yeah, yeah, he's all right. <laughs> now, Josh, uh, Josh, uh, who's recording this right now, uh, has helped us in many, many ways, and... Uh, Hence our joking about it at the moment. Big, big part of this production. Okay, here we are ascending towards the uh, Greenmont Cemetery in Durango, Colorado. And this is one of my favorite scenes uh, in the movie. It's just very dark and somber, and the lighting just really creates the mood. And I, I especially like the, uh, the soundtrack uh, during this scene. She altered it a little bit for this particular sequence, and it, it works extremely well. Uh, with the action and, and setting the mood for what's going on. I think any crime or horror film worth its salt has a graveyard scene in it. In this particular sequence, I was actually able to get permission from a friend of the family who had a departed child who I also was friends with years ago that allowed us to use his grave in the film, although we cheated location in the graveyard for uh, dramatic purposes. sure that beauty is a thing beyond the grave, that perfect bright experience never falls to nothingness. And time Okay, so we're about to uh, encounter the first appearance of the monster in Face Eater. 
And this is the only scene where you cannot actually hear the monster. Uh, in every other scene it's in, you can hear it and maybe see a claw or a shadow. But I wanted to leave the audio out in the scene just to uh, make the audience wonder, as it is the second scene in the movie, is Flex insane? And I think uh, it's a, it's a funny scene, and I think it came across pretty well. You're absolutely right. I think you're gonna really like what I've got. To. Who's he talking to? You got it, buddy. And the actors who are playing uh, got what you want back Mike and Lenny, uh, Steve Wayman, and uh, Daniel McClure, and I think they're an amazing on-screen duo. They just had a lot of fun together, and they really worked well together throughout the shoot, and it was, it was a really balanced to, uh, duo. They had a terrific energy, and that's clear as we move into scene three in the pool hall, where they may not be directly together or interacting constantly, but their relationship is still palpably uh, perceivable, and it works well. Another thing criminals like to do is play cards and shoot pool, so we had to have some sequences with those in there. Get out of here. And this actor is uh, Oscar Gillespie, who's playing the homeless man. Uh, he his, his scene is obviously very brief, but he uh, me, he is very dedicated. And behind him, you can see Josh Schoberg and Ian Warner, uh, both playing pool. Ian plays uh, Rich Thanks, in the Coscarelli scene. And of course, Josh Schoberg uh, appears throughout this movie and in the credits. Right now, you can see the, the tension building between Mike and Flex, and this continually builds throughout the film. Uh, Mike is pretty much one of the main villains until you meet uh, Romero later on and Jason. Clearly he's not happy with how Flex does things though and he thinks that Flex is weak for showing empathy towards people that are not as independent as Mike may be but ironically when Mike tells the bum, get a job, he doesn't have a legitimate income either. He's a criminal. I'll take the usual and bring a full glass of red eye for Knox. Lenny's uh, kind of almost like a child in this movie. He, he looks up to Flex and he, uh, What's your poison, Lenny? he's obviously not very intelligent, but uh, I think he's kind of instantly likable. And uh, Dan did a, an amazing job. And this is uh, Mark McCullough playing uh, Knox. And uh, he's just a real burly Brooklyn type guy. And he was perfect for this role. The shot where you follow him through the bar, handheld, is one of my favorites in the film. How you doing, Flex? Evening, Knox. This particular sequence was well edited together uh, with some tricks by Jared uh, to enhance yeah, the uh, well. humor which ends with Lenny in the lime, as you'll see momentarily. Well, should be 10 large. Good news calls and for a toast. Flex is, of course, referring to Frank who uh, he move, just killed in the, in the previous uh, scene. And Mike obviously does not appreciate that. And this, uh, this is one of my favorite lines. Uh, the kids got a Boy Scout meeting and camping trip. Uh, John always inserted a lot of uh, very dark humor into this weird world. Uh, 
of tough guys and uh it's just little stuff like that that kind of throws you off and and makes you laugh and i i always really like the humor in this movie there are some overt pieces of humor and there are some subtleties and there are a number of things that are nods to other horror and crime films and all sorts of stuff the trunk space Okay, here we are in, in my backyard uh, time. Um, this is just a brief scene to explain Mike's uh, relationship with Frank, uh, where he holds up a picture of uh, himself, Lenny, and Frank uh, at the pool hall. In better times. In better times. And he's still clearly disturbed by uh, the death of, of his friend, so... This is really just there to establish that. Again, very uh, atmospheric music in this scene. and Music really just makes this movie in a lot of ways. As we move into scene four, we get a different style of music that adds to the humorous aspects. I think anyone who isn't laughing at some parts of this is either on tranquilizers or asleep. These paranormal romances. You have a great day now. Oh, I will. And uh, I know that I and uh, along with Josh had a difficult time not laughing during uh, this shoot because we don't want to ruin uh, any of the takes, but uh, it was it was definitely hard not to. Great reaction there from John. That was Therese Tiber playing the romance lady, and we are about to be introduced to the beloved senator, played by our local celebrity, retired Senator Jim Dyer. I'm referring to, of course, my evil boss, Senator Corman. Jim Dyer had some reservations about some of the dialogue that John had uh, written for his character in this scene. So what you're hearing is basically what he gave us, or what he was willing to give us. Um, but he, he, he did a good job, and he, uh, I believe, uh, did have a, a lot of previous acting experience mostly theater, but he was very uh, excited to, to get an opportunity to play Senator Corman. And right here, uh, this is an important scene. We show the alter ego of, uh, of Flex and you know his, his day job being a Jersey comic book uh, uh, small business owner it's called a meeting with all the and his transformation to Flex uh, is something we wanted to do from day one. The noir-esque narration not only helps to establish for the audience the relationship between Flex and Corman and the other criminals, but helps to explain where he came from, the nature of the relationship, and begins to give some hints as to his background and uh, the type of motivation that motivates a character like Flex. And throughout the scene, you're going to see Flex carrying this box around uh, it's for in Christmas wrapping. And you don't really find out what it is until the end of the scene. And this is the longest scene of the movie. So it's really just there, and uh, we never really explain it. And he's pretty much uh, carrying it throughout the scene. And it keeps people wondering. However, when it does finally appear and get explained, it remains one of the favorite audience reaction items of the entire film, Slammer. One day he shows up in solitary and tells me, rap sheets or resumes. We got really lucky on some of these downtown shoots. It looks like we literally sealed off downtown and uh, had the streets to shoot in in the ways they used to look empty even back in the 1980s. But we just shot all times a day and uh, it happened to work out that way. 
And here we are with Josh Schoberg uh, on Main Street of Durango. And this was Mother's Day, and the streets were already getting very crowded. So we we really had to, to get this one done quickly and then get into the alley, uh, which actually, this is the alley that you're about to see Josh and uh, James Randall, who plays the uh, buyer, I guess, walk into is not the alley behind El Rancho. Uh, it's There was some construction going on at the time, so we had to uh, basically move a couple blocks over and up. It's actually the alley behind the Red Snapper. And you will, in the next sequence, see the interior of the Red Snapper as if it were the interior of Mama's Boy, which is where Josh's Got Crack character sends Flex to continue looking for Ed Harley. And the Got Crack shirt is just another example of uh, Face Eater's intentional uh, campiness and that we have never really taken ourselves too seriously. And after all, this is uh, primarily a dark Shit. comedy. Did, did you just let a match on the back of my fucking head? A match on the back of the head is another audience favorite. And that's uh, an homage to, uh, for a few dollars more, when Lee Van Cleef lights Am I supposed to know you or something? Uh, a match on Clive Kinski's face uh, to, to smoke his pipe. <laughs> And we're, we're a big fan of spaghetti westerns, and uh, that's where that uh, came from. And here we go. This is one of the funniest bloopers of the film. And this is a real lit cigarette being flicked into Josh's neck. And that was flicked by me. Uh, it was an accident, of course. But uh, it did hit Josh uh, right, in the, right in the throat. Uh, he was a trooper, though. He kept acting. Yeah, he did. And it lasted for just... A second long enough yeah. that you could cut away before the laughter started yep. and we could use it. Make yourself disappear, or I will. There's Josh uh, getting thrown down on the ground, uh, and he did take some abuse in the scene, but I think he uh, turned out all right. All through the movie, you see stop signs, stop lights, signs saying don't do this and that. In the sequence where I was about to throw the cigarette, you see a don't park in alley sign. And uh, as I head to Mama's Boy, you see a carnival as I'm driving by as Flex. So again, that is intentional because the whole film essentially is a carnival. You might barely notice the guy with the menus standing out in the street in front of Mama's Boy. He was going to play one of the crime characters but had to move, so we stuck him in a bit bit part. And that was Tarek O'Conn. This bar scene with Coscarelli is played by a man named Bill Smith, and he was in his late 70s at the time of this shooting. Periodically had to sit out uh, because he's a, a, a veteran of a number of wars, and um, was really a trooper uh, in, in putting up physically with what he had to. He did a great job. <laughs> That's Cody LeDuc. Uh... There with the newspaper in the background uh, as one of the goons, and this is uh, Valentina Craig. Hey, so we've got you down for she uh, is a very experienced actress and I, I believe is in New York uh, at a film school. Not exactly. I'm not sure which one, but for a friend uh, by the name she Ed did a very, very good job. A named Carly meets here well, we'll face it under her belt. She's got a long I career. Seen Mr. Harley. I certainly hope so. Coscarelli is at the bar if you'd like to speak with him. Okay, uh, here is... Uh, Drew Warner on the left and Drew Hasenzal, uh, two good friends of mine, and they willingly donated their time uh, for this scene. What's your business with Mr. This is where I began a uh, two-part homophobic joke, which we wanted as part of our politically incorrect uh, theme in the film. Uh, gets continued towards the end uh, when I mention which in Sundance, which of course relates to which Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, which was a film shot in the late 60s, partially around Durango. And here's Ian Warner, uh, Drew's brother, Drew Warner's brother. And uh, he did a very good job in this film. And 
the perfect role for him. He's kind of the brains of the operation. And the other guys are pretty much just goons. He was asking about Harley. Who the hell are you? I'd also like to mention that Bill Smith was an extra in Jaws. And you can see him walking in the background when Roy Scheider gets slapped by the mother of the dead boy. I heard you're a real tough guy. He does a good job here as Carl Coscarelli, crime boss of a competitive family to Corman's organization. What the hell kind of name is Flex Crush anyway? It's allegorical. And Coscarelli is, uh, of course, a reference to uh, the director of Phantasm. John and I both really like that horror movie, and we just wanted to give him a quick tip of the hat. Ed's a good customer, so piss off. It seems that is a mutual customer, currently overspent, and Mr. Corman doesn't forgive debts of any kind. Not my problem. Harley is an expensive turd, beneath your good intentions, wholly unworthy of the price he'll end up costing you. Can you believe this fucking guy? <laughs> the sooner you tell me what I need to know, the sooner you can get back to your drink, Sooner Butch here can bend Sundance over the table. Get this clown. I like the sequence where I'm forced out of the restaurant, through the kitchen, and out the back door. We are actually exiting the door, the exterior of Mama's Boy's restaurant after being inside the snapper. I uh, injured one of my arms in the process of taking this particular beating and taking these falls. And uh, John was really getting hit in uh, in these scenes. We didn't have any stunt men or whatnot, but uh, he, he took a beating in this one, but he, we did uh, give him knee pads and elbow pads for the falls, but sometimes you just can't prevent I can't believe they're treating you like this. Uh, even a minor injury. I agree. And this is uh, Marsha McCullough here with the dog, and she is uh, the wife of Mark McCullough. Uh, who plays Knox in the pool hall scene. My name's Crush. Flex Crush. There's Drew uh, doing his uh, Mike Tyson impression. Once again, if these guys were just smart enough to shoot Flex, they wouldn't have this problem. Flex? That's all right. I'll ask it myself. Sounds like Corman's gonna need a new man. <laughs> I think we did him a favor. Your turn. Outside. We actually stood outside in the parking lot to get this sequence correct number of hours and it's amazing how you can hold a gun and even fire it in public for extended periods of time without anyone noticing or caring. You have a video camera, you're all set. Your mother with that mouth, Carl. Lighting was especially difficult in this scene. Um, there's a large tree that provided a lot of the shadows that you're seeing but as of course as the day progressed we lost uh, the shadow, so we really had to be careful uh, to make sure it matched. God damn it, Rich. I think we all left this shoot with a nice sunburn. See how easy that was? I know I did. Since you've got the potty mouth, Carl, you get to ride in the trunk. When Bill gets shot in this sequence, we used Jello as his blood and wound, but we also ended up using ketchup as well as uh, food coloring. Corn syrup and red food coloring, yeah, that's perfect blood. Whatever you say, Carl. You can see now the sun's a little bit more prevalent here than it was, uh, you know, about 30 seconds ago, but I think it still works. Any film, even films with budgets over $4,000, have to contend with such problems.
Okay, there's a fly on the, uh, you may notice the fly at the, the uh, hood ornament of the Cadillac, and of course we didn't plan that, but once uh, we shot it, that's definitely a keeper because uh, that's, I think, metaphorical for death and rotting and, and evil. Pretty much everything that Face Eater's about, so we wanted to leave that in. brief sequence of Mr. me Trump. in the car with Rich what? is designed not only to be a little bit of dark humor, but also to reflect upon uh, Flex's not full grasp of humanity. It means nothing to him that the guys died and is nothing more than an annoyance while he's trying to get his job done and get to his promotion. I think John definitely broke some uh, speeding laws uh, uh, throughout this film. Uh, you can see him driving fairly fast, and I assure you that he was driving as fast as it looks like he's driving. And the speed limit in Durango is usually anywhere from 30 to, at the most, 40, 45 miles an hour. So, but you know, his character uh, gets things done. He he moves quickly and does necessary. Criminals don't drive like old women, and Flax is always on task and on target to keep it moving. Okay, so we're about to meet uh, Ed Harley, played by Matthew Dyer, uh, Jim Dyer's son. Matt had previously worked on the show Without a Trace and uh, was a stuntman in uh, many movies. Most recently, Days of Darkness, a zombie movie that was released just this year. I think he even worked on um, Tim Burton's remake of uh, Planet of the Apes as a stuntman. We did have a funny occurrence uh, during this particular scene. Uh, we. Uh, had left a lot of uh, the paraphernalia around the room, like beer bottles and uh, the B12 that uh, is made to look like cocaine, on a mirror with a razor blade in the room, and we arranged with the hotel uh, just to leave it how it was. Uh, unfortunately, they uh, came in and cleaned the room, but left the mirror with the B12, the razor blade, and I think the handcuffs, and uh, decided to rent the room one night and some people checked in and that's the first thing they saw and went down to the front desk and um, the front desk forgot that uh, we had this room blocked off and called the police uh, who then came down and verified that the B12 was not in fact uh, cocaine but it, it made the paper uh, the, the uh, Durango blotter and uh, we thought it was pretty funny, even though uh, it did occur on a Sunday and we lost a lot of our props because liquor stores aren't open in Colorado on Sundays. Fortunately, since we're all monks, we were able to go to our respective domiciles, secure additional empty bottles, and proceed with the scene. There were also uh, bullets, gloves, and thank God I, out of caution, had removed the guns from the scene so those weren't there to be found also. And on a separate note here, um, I want to mention that, that Flex um, repeatedly uses the same dialogue throughout the film. He says, hurts my feelings and not exactly. This is basically because Flex is a pathological killer. And he, you know, from, from John and my discussions, we believe he reads things in books. Uh, and, and repeats them as he does not have a firm grasp on uh, what is normal. And he, he, you'll hear him repeat the same things throughout the film. Flex essentially studies human behavior as he pretends to be a regular person and a book dealer during the day in his Clark Kent persona. And when he is in 
flex mode as a criminal and an enforcer, he uses the material that he reads, such as his comment about body language to Josh and his got crack sh shirt, uh, as a way of trying to deal with as well as understand what an actual human being would be thinking or feeling. mention real quickly too that uh, the hallway that uh, Matt Dyer and John just walked through was a filming location for National Lampoon's Vacation uh, where Chevy Chase uh, robs the uh, what's supposed to be the Grand Canyon and runs out that same hallway that they just entered so we wanted to put that in as just a little reference to that even though a lot of people may not know that. The hallway Jared's referring to is in the Strader Hotel and where the crime bosses are looking at a picture of Flex in a sillier moment with teddy bears um, is filmed inside the now defunct after 47 years Diamond Circle melodrama. He's always been a couple of cans shy of a six pack Hooper. It's a nice likeness though, don't you think? He's late. He'll be here. I told him to bring some entertainment. Jared repeatedly used signs in the film where you see Watch Your Step and Ed Harley Falls is the most basic of fl slapsticks that we could stick in, but it works well as we proceed. Please. This sequence where Flex explains that it's okay for for Ed to go inside and meet Corman is another example of the humor of him trying to understand human behavior as Flex tells him, lots of people feel awkward at parties, just be yourself. Okay, here we see uh, Meg Cook who plays Corman's squeezed Nancy and you'll also see her later in the film playing Flex's daughter, Lois Crush. And this is Steve Frost with the eye patch. That's a reference uh, to Escape from New York, uh, John and my favorite movie. And uh, he uh, has had a, a considerable amount of acting experience, as has uh, Jim Dyer. All of the crime bosses in this scene as Jared pointed out earlier with Bill Smith's character, Coscarelli, the director of Phantasm, the characters are named Hooper, Cronenberg, and Carpenter, respectively. John Carpenter, obviously, we not only dedicated the film to, but as Jared just mentioned, uh, the uh, Snake Plistin character from Escape from New York is responsible for Romero's eye patch. Romero, of course, being the director of Night of the Living Dead, Hooper, being known for uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Cronenberg for films like Scanners, and Videodrome. I asked you all here today. Okay, and you can now see the, uh, the tension building between Romero and Flex. And what the contents of uh, the box uh, are about to be revealed. Thank you, Carpenter. And that certainly does not please uh, Romero. It does, however, tie in with the uh, monster theme that is more fully explained in the fortune teller scene, which is four scenes from now. Alley thug. Flex may be a thug, but there's nothing common about it. That's what I love about Romero. He's so much fun to be around. What kind of nut job photographs himself reading to teddy bears? <laughs> <laughs> it was a children's fundraiser. Mr. Corman understands the need to maintain a public persona better than anyone. I act accordingly. Exactly right, Flex. Oh. 
What the hell is this? I got it over the holidays. Turns out it belongs to you. This remains one of the most popular audience reaction items. Those are my hands. They're opening the box. Which was filmed Jesus in my Christ. living room. Actually, As Christian had moved away and he was back in town for a brief period of time, so we you got to finally finish his bitch. his character's <laughs> presence in the film. It may not have been his most difficult role, playing a dead head in a box, but it was an important one. He's down. He's provoking you. Jim Dyer's character, Corman, clearly is evil he because he enjoys uh, watching this turmoil among his own people, even though in any type of sane, even criminal, normal circumstances, this would be over the top, outrageous, and completely unacceptable. Unless you were just deranged beyond belief. Thanks for the champagne and the promotion, Mr. Corman. But I'd better be getting along. I've got some meat in my trunk that's gonna go bad. In scene one, I make a reference when I'm leaving the bookstore and I tell him to leave the head that I've got a steak waiting for me at home. And in this sequence, I have just said that I need to go because I've got some meat in my trunk that's gonna go bad. Both of these items seem innocuous early on, but have uh, great meaning when we reach the end of the film. Batman seems so tormented. Yes, but God help his tormentors. Here in scene six, we go back to the carnival music provided by Minor, and it does a nice job of enhancing some of the silly humor. In this case, comic geeks arguing over the first appearance of Wonder Woman. The JLA first appeared in The Brave and the Bull number 28. Everyone knows that. Spencer and Sean, and they, they had good chemistry together as well. Two kids on the right are Christian's uh, children, and the other one, I believe his name is Palmer, is uh, Lydia Myers, my friend from high school, the lady in this scene that is uh, telling the kids to say thank you and holding the book. Uh, she's standing in front of the cooking section, which has a little irony uh, for the film. In this scene, I, I told John I wanted him to walk in looking really tough, pushing out his chest so he can have a one-up on these geeks, and it's just a little thing that we wanted to throw in there, and he's just trying to make himself appear bigger than he is, just to add to the humor. And in fact, for those who notice carefully, as I argue with them and say, actually, you're both wrong, by the time I get to finishing my sentence. You didn't know. My voice has changed from the voice that you're hearing right now, or similar to this voice, to a, a voice that sounds like this, like the other comic games. So that is a subtlety that, that some people may pick up on or not. Okay, so here we are in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Steve, Daniel, and myself I uh, made this trip in the summer of, uh, I believe it was uh, 2005, up to shoot this scene. And originally we were just going to shoot uh, outside because we had been in informed by Jim Dyer that we would need permits and people would uh, harass us if we were inside shooting. And of course they walked in the doors and noticed nobody was around. So we just brought the camera in and uh, did some guerrilla filmmaking and got this done. and. Probably less than 10 minutes, but uh, some people snapped some photos of us, and, and that was about it. Photos once you told them you were making a movie, because they thought maybe they'd have something important. Right, yeah. 
you couldn't do that today because uh, only a few <laughs> months ago, some nut job went to the state capitol with a gun, and now they have heavy security. It's so, yeah. so it's a good thing we filmed this when it's we did. To fly into the... So here we cut right back to Durango. Um, this is actually inside the Newman building downtown, and it was as close as we could get to the state capitol. Uh, but it's so brief, it, it, it serves its purpose, and... Uh, this office is the old post office post on Main office. Street. Okay, and uh, Jim Dyer uh, actually brought in the law books you see behind him on the shelf. And he also wanted a picture of Dick Cheney behind him. Had the bright idea to come Daniel McClure, my son, found, after Googling, a particularly nasty picture of Dick Cheney snarling. And that's the one we chose to frame and put behind Jim Dyer. Homeland Security did a Which worked well for the Homeland Security line, I think. It did. Sorry, sir. Just so the audience knows, Jim Dyer asked to be in the film. We did not approach him. You know the one I'm talking about? I'll find it. Eight o'clock. Be there. The end of this sequence where he says, I'll kick your ass into the next life. I had originally written, I will bitch slap you into the next life. But since his wife Sherry is on the Domestic Violence Coalition, he was disinclined to say that particular line. All right, and uh, we are at uh, Colfax. Again, in Denver, Colorado. And uh, for those uh, in the know, Colfax is, uh, or at least East Colfax, is not considered to be one of the best neighborhoods in town. And uh, we were yeah, in East East Colfax to, to shoot this scene uh, with the Satire Lounge, and it was interesting. Satire Lounge is a place that uh, your dad and uh, John and Therese Tiber, that both play characters in the film, used to hang out in the 70s. Yeah, it was a big uh, jazz club. And here we had a lady uh, asking us if we were from cops in this uh, alley. Well, ironically, this alley that you cut away to in a moment yeah, is shot behind the police station in Durango. Yep, we cut back to Durango here uh, in this next clip. Right here. The homeless man that is crouching in the alley that Steve is about to be unkind to was actually a poor fellow who got burned out Absolutely. of the Central Hotel when that lunatic set fire to it and uh, I ended up helping him get his cat back after the building was sealed up after uh, much arguing and some newspaper publicity. And this scene really uh, illustrates the temperament of, of um, the character Mike before he argues uh, with Flux about uh, giving the homeless man money and then now he ends up killing a homeless man. And it really lets the audience know that he's a formidable villain to, to, to be dealt with later on in the film because originally that had not been written. It also juxtaposes the fact that although Flex is accused of being merciless, he does have bits of empathy that... Uh, and morals. Right, right, absolutely. And, and uh, Steve's character, Mike, lacks those very empathies that people accuse Flex of not having. He perceives the homeless men as weak, and he perceives Flex as weak for having mercy upon them. Okay, so now we cut back to Durango uh, in Mama's Boy restaurant. Basement. And uh, this is uh, one of the funny Lenny scenes. <laughs> this is Tara uh, Joukowsky. And she had no previous acting experience, but did, uh, did a good job. A recurring theme throughout the film is Lenny's attempts to uh, get a girlfriend 
and his uh, clumsy efforts at such, uh, which never reach fruition, but which add much to the humor of the film. Mike is appealing to Corman to understand that Flex is completely insane, and the flashback sequence that you were about to see is the first scene that we ever shot. Thankfully, because I am visibly younger in this scene than I was by the time we finished filming. And you can see that John has a full beard in the two flashbacks you're about to see, this one and the, the one that follows. And it adds more of a youthful uh, appearance and uh, just makes it more obvious that it's a different time period. Also, of course, the, the Cadillac yeah, I'm driving is, is a red Cadillac, and the newer one is the tan Cadillac. Okay, this is Jeff Harris, uh, Kenneth Rowe, and Eric Crabtree. Eric Crabtree. And they had a lot of fun during the shoot, and as John said, it was the first shoot of the film. We're all a little bit green, but uh, watching it now, it turned out really well. And John's character, Flex, is basically composed of a mix between Snake Plissken uh, from Escape from New York and uh, Clint Eastwood in the uh, Man With No Name trilogy. Uh, what do you guys ironically, think? Snake Plissken based his character in Escape from New York off Clint Eastwood, so this it all comes to comes around. But uh, Art imitates life, imitates art. Right. And, of course, here we're homaging... Uh, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, which is one of my favorite movies. This scene is, is an attempt to get the audience to like Flex because, again, he's, he's a psychopath and he behaves in a way that's not socially acceptable. But him saving the dog in this scene uh, gets the audience to like him a little bit and understand who he is. And as we all know that uh, somebody who saves a dog in a movie is going to be an audience favorite. And it shows there's more to Flex than simply the bottom line. Yeah, he kills people. He'll also kill them for free if the reason is there. Always remember to throw lit cigarettes in the fields. What a good boy. You're coming home with daddy. And Mike begins to get uh, frustrated here because he's trying to convince uh, Corman that Flex is crazy, but he still just doesn't seem to get it. And he becomes more and more frustrated. You know he brought that well, Corman's been drinking. He's drinking more. And uh, he's starting to loosen up. He's feeling good about telling stories. Uh, you're about to hear another story, uh, another flashback, uh, where Flex once again steps wait, forward, wait. Uh, doing a job killing, but also killing because he sees something that he thinks is unacceptable. Strike two for Lenny. This is one of our early shoots as well. We um, this is the end of the day when we uh, shot the Maliva sequence that follows uh, a couple scenes later, and uh, we had been filming for about twelve hours. It was snowing. Uh, the camera water got into the camera, and it was acting up. So we were basically exhausted by the time we shot this. But uh, again, this scene turned out really well in the snow is a nice uh, addition to the scene. Well, it, it establishes again that it's a different time period, that it's a flashback with my beard. It shows some of the natural beauty of the area, and uh, it just works well. Right there, uh, this character's name is Harold Hellman, who, of course, is uh, a character in Escape from New York. And originally, the TV screen uh, Harold Helmet? was uh, playing Escape from New York and 
we were advised to remove that. And uh, my brother Mark did a great job at inserting Night of the Living Dead in place of it, which is now public domain. So. This sequence with the mist behind Lex uh, and the snow falling um, is also really nice and atmospheric. And uh, again, what you see is humor mixed with serious circumstances, hence the nickname Crimedy. What the fuck are you looking at? Not much. That's another crowd pleaser. <laughs> People like that. Who doesn't want to shoot a wife beater? An extra stiff. I mean, it's cut Frank's head off. And the hands, too, no doubt. It's hard to ID a torso. Mr. Corman, with all due respect, you haven't seen Flex lately. He's gone nuts. He talks to thin air. Basically, you're looking at additional setup and dialogue before we go into one of our coolest yeah. transitions. You know, you doing it the other Most day. shocking. Fucking A. Yet another politically incorrect item. Torture has been uh, named as one of the least acceptable items in TV and film over the last couple of years. A lot of wet blankets being put on that particular item. A lot of uh, critics and sources. And uh, so naturally we had to stick it in there. We'd be glad to help any way we can, Mr. Corman. And also, you, you may notice that everybody in this movie smokes. And that, of course, is not an accident. We were trying to be uh, as politically incorrect as possible throughout the, the shooting of this movie. Once it's done, go see I think we were successful. I did, too. Thank you, sir. You can count on us. That's the transition, you can't beat this. Yeah. So here we, we're jumping to the basement of the bookcase. And this yeah. is one of my uh, least favorite Flex shoots. Is gonna have an accident. Dumb and Dumber will be coming to see to sell a little it. mold poisoning, never hurt anyone. No, no, I, I was better after a couple months. Um, It'll be my pleasure. So here we are introduced to Jason, hence the- Jason. Oh, he mask. Is gonna have flex crush food. Just another tie-in to endless horror game, movies, and we put that fucking bastard of course down. the uh, old hag played by Ann Perkins Parrot is yet another smoker in a smoker's film. This, this is my only appearance in the film, uh, is the man being tortured, and Jason is uh, Jason is played by Keith Harlan. Irish born gentleman who can turn his Irish accent on and off very skillfully. Yeah. This sequence at the bookcase where it was raining outside leads into the fortune teller scene Flex. featuring Maliva, played by Vengeance my wife, Diane Wilder McClure. The same once you she lie. also plays my Mrs. Husband. Crush in the final scene of the I've film. Been expecting you. We stood outside in the street, and my son Dan took a hose and sprayed the street so that we could match the weather from the store where it was raining to look like it had been raining out here. And that's a very uh, uh, carpenter uh, way of shooting things. Um, he typically does that in his movies because a lot of them take place at night and the lights reflecting off the street adds a really, really cool 
atmosphere. And I know his cinematographer, I can't remember his name at the moment, uh, has done that in a lot of other films. This sequence with the severed heads on the wall as I walk through Maliva's house was shot in my parents' basement and the severed animal heads are actually trophies that uh, are uh, part of the collection of uh, my stepdad. And here you're about to see uh, a book of the dead at the far right of this table. And that is of course a reference to the evil dead uh, another one of our favorite movies. Also a low-budget independent horror film. They had a series of mistakes that are kind of famous in that film that they left in because they had no choice. But it works great and uh, it's gone on to be a uh, huge money maker. Uh, the third installment, Army of Darkness, is even uh, cross-marketed in comic books and other things today. Video games, all kinds of stuff. In this scene... Uh... The scene wasn't uh, one of our favorites to shoot. Uh, you'll see all the candles in the background. Uh, that room got a, got to be up to 103 degrees, I believe. Uh, at times, uh, we had wax dripping on us, and the camera even malfunctioned at, at one point. We also had some casting issues with um, the Maliva character. I believe uh, Diane was our third or fourth choice fourth choice fourth choice but in retrospect it gave us a lot of time to improve things and get the, the set uh, how we wanted it I suppose we shouldn't say she was our fourth Bond. choice she was our first choice and she did the best job but the first three bombed True. so uh, we went with her because uh, we were trying to make an intentional comedy and she did a good job And John knows a little bit about uh, tarot cards, and he has told me that the placement of these cards in the order they are being laid down is very significant. Each position in the tarot represents a different aspect of the fortune that's being told. Were someone to actually get the reading that is being placed in front of Flex in this scene, it would be like being told you have about 24 hours to live before being hit with a meteor. The tower card being in the final position is the outcome, which speaks for itself considering it's exploding and people are falling off of it. Part of the insane face eater world we were trying to create. Forces are aligning against you. Betrayal. You're hearing an altered version of the song that was playing in the graveyard scene which is again one of my favorites and I think it really really sets the mood for this scene as well okay so here we're cutting back to a flashback uh, you'll see John looking uh, noticeably younger with the uh, the full beard we shot all the, the scenes with him uh, with the, the beard first obviously and I think it's just a little Something extra, just to let people know that it is indeed a flashback. We borrowed props for this scene from multiple businesses, multiple individuals, and uh, even ourselves. A tablecloth that sits on the table with the crystal ball was something that Jared had for college. It was subsequently destroyed with wax during the filming of this scene, but will remain immortalized forever. And uh, the conversation that's, that's going on right now, Maliva is basically explaining how uh, by raising this demon Asmodon, that uh, Lex will become more like this character more like the monster and the monster will become like him and from this we're, we're borrowing from uh, the movie the horror movie Pumpkinhead and it's kind of a similar circumstance and uh, we were both big fans of that movie and we thought it was a cool idea 
it's not. Good. We're also borrowing from the gypsy scene in Phantasm. It is so And um, dead. we're also borrowing the name Ed Harley for Matt Dyer's character from Pumpkinhead. I believe Ed Harley was also a character in Watch Lives. Right. But they're going to die anyway. <sighs> The tower portends destruction and catastrophe. Your cunning and my resources must come into play. Here we show some close-ups of the judgment card so that the audience understands when Flex finally picks up the card that there has been a change what as an aspect of the supernatural. Them First clue being Maliva's eyes. Second one being that instead of the normal judgment card, suddenly the audience is confronted with a large chicken on the tarot card, which is, of course, Asmodon the monster. I'd like to add that uh, the glowing eyes for Maliva was originally written in the script from John, but early on in the process, we didn't know how we were going to do that because, for one, we didn't know anybody who who could do that. And it just so happened that uh, towards the end of the film, my uh, brother uh, was starting up his own graphic design company and offered to uh, to do this for us. And he did, a, he did again, an amazing job. Seen it added a lot. This sequence that we're uh, stepping into way. now is really uh, nothing more than the skip forward where Corman has instructed them to do business as usual for a few days and find an opportunity to uh, take Flex by surprise. We also decided to cut a lengthy poker scene and replace the Face Eater card game, uh, not only as a tie-in to the title of the film, but to give the Lenny Mike uh, humor piece and uh, just sort of... Um, Add a, another little uh, face eater tie-in since there's more to it than just the film. Like you, Lenny. And sitting at the table is uh, Lucas Zedjkowski and Mario Gomez. And uh, Lucas has had uh, a good amount of acting experience theater. Um, he originally told a lengthy joke, which uh, has been a crowd pleaser, but uh, it just it it just seemed to take uh, a little bit too much up of the scene. So in the end. I decided, uh, collectively with John, that we were going to axe that part, uh, not due to his performance, but just due to the, the pacing of the scene. Here in the background, we can see an Escape from New York poster and a Blade Runner poster. The fortune cookie that Mike is about to toss to Flex that he opens and which says Time to Die is a uh, direct tie-in to the film Blade Runner. Uh, because uh, the uh, replicant in the beginning uh, who is threatening to kill um, Deckard. Deckard says time to die and then later also uh, Rudger Hauer as he's dying at the end of the film no says time to die for you Blade Runner fans out there I know we are, it's one of my favorite films mine as well Get up, Flex. Not only was Lucas's joke uh, a crowd pleaser, but we had to get rid of it to help the pacing Lenny. of the film and the scene. We also eliminated uh, some aspects That's of the Face Eater game and how it was played because it sounded like a commercial. And uh, one thing we always agreed from the beginning is that we wanted the best possible product. So um, a lot of times you got to look at the aspect that party. less is more and cuts are smart. We killed plenty of my lines in the film, too, here and there, just to make it move better. And this night was freezing. Uh, you'll see that Mike and Lenny uh, are basically chain-smoking, and we did that to cover up their breath. Uh, this uh, was an especially out. cold night Kinda like in Durango. You can see uh, Mike's nose turning red from the cold, and only cigarettes could began to cover that up. We actually tried to say our lines without exhaling 
Mr. Corman and gave us a nod hold to our breath reflexes. as much as possible. We work for Romero now. Because uh, during the winter, we'd shoot inside as much as possible, but this was a sequence that we had no choice. We needed to get it out of the way. There's a very good moment between um, Flex and Lenny, and they have a, a, a particular bond throughout the film, almost like a father and a son, nice we is, is how I've always taken it. Right and right. you can see... That, Flex is obviously displeased with the betrayal, and Lenny is in fact uh, ashamed, and that he's basically being led along by Mike. As we move into scene 11, where we first meet the monster, and where uh, Steve, with the reluctant Lenny, is taking Flex out to do away with him, we see more aspects of the guilt that Lenny feels about how Flex is being treated which, of course, to. is a device in the narrative to allow Flex to uh, ultimately overcome with the help, of course, of the appearance of Asmodon. This part, where we're in the car at the top of the Colorado Trail, was a particular nuisance. We went up five or six weekends to get this brief piece done because it's a popular area and people kept pulling up, walking by, stopping and interfering most of them were understanding, some of them were rude, but we this. made them go away and we finally got it done. And we were on uh, a time limit with this scene because as you can see, the leaves are starting to change, which put pressure on us to get this filmed so it would match. And it turns out one of my favorite things about this scene is you can Morning, see sunshine. things progressively dying. Let's go. So right now the leaves are changing and there's still some green, but. Uh, when we reach the end of the scene, everything's pretty much dead, which is a metaphor. Absolutely. You have to work with what you got timing-wise and environment-wise. Uh, when we're down in the woods after Mike's done abusing me and I've gone on the death walk, literally almost all the leaves are gone, and through Jared's careful uh, sequencing and shooting around the circumstances, you can't see the snow that's piled all around us as we're finishing that scene because it's you now gone really from August to November. Chair. It took so long to finish. You deserve this, you rotten bastard. Get moving. Corman only involves Romero. For one and Steve Wayman, who plays Mike, uh, was one of our most dedicated actors in the film, and he has about the third most screen time. Uh, and he really delivered uh, crazy, in this film, Mr. And I think uh, he should Romero's be very proud of his work. When he does, we move up I agree. There's no way he's leaving you two doofuses. I think Dan made a great Lenny, too. too. Oh, he did, and that's one thing I wanted to mention as well, is that, uh, is that all the little quirks you see Lenny doing that are, are comedic throughout the movie were not written. And he really brought his character to life in ways that uh, were not scripted. And he basically just did things and uh, really added a lot to his character. And you'll see more of that in the final scene of the movie. But all throughout the film, if you watch his character, he always has a little something that he's, he's added to it. Our strategy from the beginning was to welcome people if they had a good idea or a way of expanding or, or recreating their character to be them that we fully encouraged them to do so, and that improved our final product tremendously. The scenery you capture in this is amazing. It really shows the beauty of the area. It was a perfect time of year to shoot this, this scene. We actually shot this before we shot the part up at the top of the trail. You, right. Here's a spot where Lenny shows a soft spot for, for Flex. Killed Frank. And Flex is playing on his guilt to do just that. He's been talking to him the whole way on the walk, saying, I feel sorry for you, whittling away at his determination to stick with Mike. I never beat up or mistreated Frank. I waited until he was done lying to kill him.
think I'd give you the satisfaction of running like a coward. You can shoot me in the back if I do. That ain't happening. I originally wrote him not stuff. like this. What are you doing? <laughs> he don't deserve Or him this. not deserve this. And uh, yeah. Dan said, I don't want to be retarded, Still just slow. So he changed the line to, he don't deserve this, which worked great. Step back, Lenny. Remember, we're doing the world a favor by taking... We actually had a family with a baby carriage pushing through while we were shooting this. It's always fun to laugh and smile and... Well, I couldn't wave because I was handcuffed, but uh, when you're standing around in dark clothing with guns on a nature trail, uh, it can be interesting when the general public's walking by. Okay, so here you see the characters walking into a dark uh, mess of trees, and then now pretty much everything is dead in this scene. You can see there's no really any green and everything's just kind of brown and it's a big uh, drastic change from the beginning of the scene when Flex gets uh, pulled out of the trunk. It's far enough. Remember, Steve was not feeling particularly good this day. I believe he see that show? Uh, was fluish. And, uh, I see it. Yeah, he I, stuck uh, it out. Use it. I uh, I asked him to uh, do his best to survive the day because of our weather circumstance, and uh, as usual, he stuck in there. Everyone gave 110 percent to make this film actually as good as it is and help us to actually finish it. Here we see the monster finally uh, coming out of the scene. And uh, I think that's one of the funniest sequences. And John and I agreed early on uh, that we didn't want to show the monster because a man in a, a rubber chicken suit would just be ridiculous and people would laugh uh, at us instead of with us. And it's a typical uh, Hitchcock approach. Uh, you let the audience uh, use their imagination and uh, that can actually make it more horrific than if you actually had the effects to create a monster. And we weren't trying to do an alien or predator level monster. The reason we chose an eight foot chicken was humor. Nobody had ever had a chicken monster before. Those are two shots pieced together, spliced, and turned out pretty well. I think we got the nice whiz of the knife flying by. It was as seamless as the uh, spinning joke sequence with Lenny and the Lime in the bar sequence. And Steve later told me after we finished this that he he had been depressed oh after God. he shot this death scene. Um, exactly. As I said earlier, Steve is a very uh, dedicated actor and he's very serious about it. So when uh, Mike died, he kind of took that as a part of himself. Uh, was gone as well Rest and pieces, um, I think it translated very well on the screen and, and again he, he did a magnificent job. I remember you telling me you that first. in between weekend shoots that he would dress in character and walk around downtown right. just so that he could get into character. That's impressive I mean considering nobody uh, was paid on this project uh, to find a level of dedication is, is a rarity. I think he appreciated how hard we were trying and how much we cared about this. This sequence where the monster hands me a cigarette is probably my personal favorite. And I, I from the beginning, I wanted to shoot this all in one take because I thought, um, as far as humor, it would just make it all the more funny if we didn't cut. And just that all this stuff is happening at once, and you add in the sound effects and the, the gore, it just it turns out to be a, a really funny scene. It works terrific as one continuous shot, and it also shows just how crazy Flex is because he casually sits and smokes a cigarette while you hear the monster <laughs> chewing the flesh off the skull. And the fact that the monster actually hands him the cigarette has reinforced what we stated earlier, that the monster is becoming like Flex. And vice and, versa. And vice versa. 
Craven's we develop similar tastes. We're gonna preview our latest so here we are at uh, in the basement of uh, John's parents' house where we filmed the entrance to the Maliva scene with the uh, monster heads, uh, which is back down the hallway right there. And this is the first of two gunfight climaxes where I try to uh, bring home to Romero the pain and suffering that he has brought to others and uh, put to bed the long-standing conflict that Bart sits between us. Here's Bart play. Collins playing Bart as the main guy uh, that Romero leaves in charge when he goes to meet Craven, the head of another crime boss, uh, to watch one of his disgusting snuff films. And that is Bart's uh, Captain America dune buggy, and he's a big <laughs> Captain America fan. Yes, he is. A lot of comic book themes in this. And this shot was uh, written into the script by John. Uh, I, I liked it. We basically don't cut, and we just wait. And the music is still playing, and it just gives it a nice... Uh, point of view for the audience that Flex just missed Romero. Yeah. Except for a couple of connective sequences like uh, Steve burning the picture and me later dropping a child off at the police station and Lenny's humor, we pretty much followed the script except when we had to cut things out because it didn't work as well or we couldn't do what we wanted. And also like some improvisation Absolutely. was always... Uh, implemented okay so that's Austin Flynn on the left Carl Murphy in the middle and Angel Ruiz uh, on the right hand side of Bart and these guys had a, a really good time shooting this because they all got to fire guns in the, <laughs> in the house and uh, I believe that's dead man's hand if I'm not mistaken. aces and eights are, are dead man's hand also it was supposed to be humorous because he's folding to the only other hand you can see, which isn't as good <laughs> in A7. Yeah. So uh, in this brief scene, you can see that Bart's character is not very uh, intelligent. <laughs> this is one of my favorite sequences. Because it's very funny. What are you, lost Bible boy? Not according to the prophecy. When he says I look like Johnny no, Cash, it was unintentional. But if you notice, like uh, Kenneth Rowe's shirt from the uh, redneck flashback, he's wearing a Johnny Cash shirt. Right. Are you going to read to me now? As you wish, little brother. This verse says, he who lives like a cockroach. Okay, and Bart actually got uh, hurt during that uh, shot right there. We had reinforced his shirt with um, newspaper. newspaper and the blank blew a hole through that and into his arm. Well, it, it didn't quite get through the paper. What happened was that he got about 80 little blood spots of tattooing from the uh, blank extending beyond the impact point. So um, although uh, he wasn't seriously injured, he, he did obviously have some, some little uh, pin spots. And uh, after the, the two sequences we shot, he asked that we not shoot anymore and added, at least now you guys know I'm not a pussy. There's Bart again, uh, that's his arm. <laughs> a funny sequence there. Uh, you can see when he does open the door, we, we filmed the gunshots first and when he opens the door you can see the uh, specks on his, um, on his arms from the the blank. Anytime you see me reloading in close-up, I'm using actual ammo. And of course, we're using blanks the rest of the time, but I wanted the audience repeatedly to see, and there's many examples throughout the film, that we have real bullets so that we had whatever measure of realism we could accomplish. There's a classic Western motif of somebody tossing their hat, the guy falling for it. I mean, silly stuff, but it works. Hello, Jason. 
Sorry, I couldn't ventilate you sooner. For those who watch the bloopers, they'll see a uh, piece where I shoot Jason, played by Keith Carlin, in the knee, and he actually says, that hurt, because I'm so close with the gun, uh, the uh, gases coming out actually uh, hit him in the knee, and uh, it uh, smarted a bit. Also, uh, you find out in this sequence in a moment uh, that I wasn't named Flex Crush by Corman because I'm muscular, but because I suffer from dandruff. He's out the army. <sighs> see how easy that was? Another example of repetitive dialogue where I say, see how easy that was. Well, right. Tell me why Corman named you Flex. <sighs> how unkind of you to mention it. Could happen to anybody who wears dark clothing. I remember you were concerned initially, Jared, that the audience wouldn't get that joke, but pretty much everybody yeah. does. Yeah, yeah. There is a couple things in, in the script that I just didn't think people would uh, completely get, but uh, I was wrong. <laughs> you know, it worked out great. Yeah. That's very dramatic. Uh, shot here along with the music uh, that's good take of John there and this is uh, Dylan his name is Carlin. Devin Devin excuse me don't worry kid. and uh, considering the trouble most filmmakers have with kids he he did really well and Devin is uh, Keith Harlan's son who plays Jason not exactly Andrew did you shoot all the bad men most of them. I'm going to make sure it's safe. Okay, you'll notice again that uh, Flex says, not exactly. And, you know, as we mentioned earlier, he does repeat himself throughout the Cross film. Heart and, hope to die. and that was very intentional in John's script. You promise me something? The audience feels like they know Flex by the end of the film because when he says, hurts my feelings, not exactly, see how easy that was, things like this, he's repeating his actions and his thought processes and you feel like you kind of know where he's coming from and where he might go. It's also a literary device but it certainly solidifies uh, what Jared's saying which is Flex is pathological and uh, functions repetitively in the same patterns basically forcing things to happen regardless of circumstance. Please help me. And again this uh, the purpose of this scene, one of the, the purposes of this scene is um, to again get the audience to like Flex, he um, he does have morals, uh, regardless of what he does. And this scene, uh, by helping the the kid out and uh, the dog scene earlier, uh, the audience will know that Flex um, does have a conscience and he does uh, have morals on his own standards. But they're strictly his own standards. Right. Any normal uh, human rating of behavior or or ethics would be uh, well above the standard that Flex is performing at, but he does have his own code which causes him to behave in certain ways, which is more than you can say for the other villains, which are utterly irredeemable and without likable qualities. And you will notice that uh, Flex dropped off Andrew at the uh, police station, and that was not written Flex into the crushed. script, but I strongly right. felt My that the audience needed to see that Flex got him to safety and that uh, everything worked out. Got better. Flex likes women and kids and animals. He's a little soft on people. <laughs> this is John Tiber. He is uh, playing Craven, and Flex makes a joke from Escape from New York when he's like, when Craven asks him, I heard you were dead, and he says, I got better. That's right out of the running repetitive joke about Snake in Escape from New York, where I heard you were dead. And John is the husband of Therese Tiber, who played the romance novel Lady in Scene 4. Coincidentally, uh, 
John and I met through uh, Therese Tiber um, through strange uh, circumstances. Twenty some years ago, I sold him comics to get out of college, and when Jared was finishing his senior seminar, they were advertising comics. He went in to find out some information about who we could talk to about comic books, and they sent them to me. I was running and owning the bookcase downtown. We struck up a friendship, and after I saw Jared's film, Lurid Kiss, play at the Abbey Theater, I immediately approached him with the concept of making this movie, and here it is. And the High Noon poster, uh, there on the wall, that is uh, that is mine, and uh, we wanted to put that in there as it's one of our favorite movies. And it kind of follows the same uh, storyline, just kind of a lone uh, gunman, uh, against a whole mob of people standing up for what he believes. And, uh... Of course, Gary Cooper was a normal stand-up guy. Yeah, well, you know, Lex is a least stand-up guy in, in his own way. He's a good family man. I'm the better shot, Crush! I've still got you on charisma! Throughout this uh, gunfight sequence in the Abbey, we, as in many places in the film, having a low budget, tried to do what we could to add little details for realism. You may notice right at the end where we've shot around repeatedly that there is a bullet hole on the wall next to Romero and yet another one on the pole next to where I'm firing from behind right before I shoot Romero. Okay, and here we see the monster shadow, also courtesy of uh, Mark, and uh, again, it's a little piece, but it really adds a lot. I love the mix of the uh, paper mache feathered uh, internet rubber monster hands combined with the uh, monster shadow. That Mark did, and um, it just adds a lot to have that shadow there added to the, the silly prop that we had. Uh, as you said before, working with the Hitchcock thing, the sequence with the claw moving up and down as Romero's laying on the floor is probably my favorite of all the special effects, although they're all excellent. When you see Jason in hell, be sure to remind him of how clever you are. Go ahead and chew this one right off the stem, Big Bird. Lex kills people routinely and doesn't think much of it, but in a case like Romero where he sincerely dislikes him, it's particularly harsh to have him tell the monster to go ahead and chew his head right off the stem and then stand there and laugh his brains out as it happens. One of my favorite pieces. And yes, that's my real laugh. Okay, here we are. Uh, this is actually John's home. And this is an homage to Back to the Future um, at the end when Biff is waxing the McFly's uh, BMW, I believe it is. Uh, except, you know, Lenny is actually a favorable character, even though Biff is still just Biff. But anyway, that's always was one of my favorite movies growing up, and I know Josh certainly likes it too. There are so many things that tie into other films, it's really not possible uh, for us to mention them all, and we have not mentioned them all. So if you notice things that seem to tie into other things, you're probably there deliberately. The commentaries only allow to say so many things. But I didn't connect the dots until Romero's name. I take my glasses off when Corman calls because it's back to that Clark Kent uh, double identity piece. Uh, Lex is flex without the glasses. He puts them back on. He goes back to family man. And that's the dichotomy of the character. He lives in two different worlds. But the overall face theater world is completely insane. And, frankly, most of the characters in the film are as crazy or crazier than Flex is, although they keep saying how crazy Flex is. That was part of the humor that we intended, that people would juxtapose other people's insanity and then tell Flex how crazy he is. 
And here we are in Eureka, Colorado. This is outside of Silverton. And this is a beautiful area, uh, very cinematic. And uh, I believe we left this shoot with, uh, I know I left it with the worst sunburn I've ever had. And I don't think I'm alone there. <laughs> that elevation, it's 11,000 feet. Yes, it is. Approximately 11,000. Um, Silverton is 9,300, and we drove 10 miles up uh, to, to reach this location of Eureka, Colorado. Uh, this is actually an old mill that we are about to walk up, and at the top of that mill is a mine shaft, which will theoretically hold Romero's remains. Okay. Uh, Flex just said uh, up Lenny all the way to the top. That's a reference to uh, White Heat, uh, one of the great film noirs uh, starring uh, James Cagney. And uh, it serves as a metaphor for our, our hopes for the movie and um, just all the work we put into it. Absolutely. This uh, family meal sequence, which is the uh, very end of the film, is... Uh, something we shot in less than four hours, very rushed in an afternoon, and uh, it turned out amazingly well, uh, considering the pressure we were under. I think this part where I pull an ear out of the stew and then uh, fish out a couple of fingers, which quickly end up, after I make sure my family isn't looking, down the garbage disposal, is a classic uh, reference to EC Comics and the kind of thing that uh, went on um, that we admire from the past. The book Mask of Sanity is actually a book on psychopaths written by a doctor and is famous on the subject. His name was Herbie Cleckley and uh, he uh, probably wrote the first real book on uh, that type of, of maniac. You'll see every uh, dish and the napkin that Lenny has uh, all have chickens and roosters on them. And that's just a slight uh, reference to the monster. And another aspect of how I become more like it and it like me. Right. After yeah. all, my appetite's changed. Thank you. In a moment, you'll see Lenny eating some stew, and it was so funny that Jared, who's holding the camera, wasn't able to hold it completely still, and you can see just the tiniest jiggle because uh, he's dying of laughter. And I, I like to think about what uh, uh, Flex's son, Clark, is, is, is reading that book for and what he thinks about his family and his father uh, because the, the kids are obviously... Uh, they have teenage, issues. Teenagers and they have issues, and his wife is definitely out there. And uh, you gotta wonder what's running through their heads, especially when they don't give him a reply to how school going. This stuff tasted and smelled horrible. It was like. Econo style big cans of stuff you'd hesitate to feed to a dog you didn't like. And uh, Dan, like a trooper, slurped it down, take after take, shoveling it into his face. And um, did a great job of it. Uh, I was barely able to taste a couple of tiny bits and pretend I was eating it at all. It's dreadful. Honey, the stew is so amazingly good. The flavor is, is just incredible. Are you ever going to tell us your secret recipe? This final piece where Flex explains uh, his take on uh, his cooking is uh, as good of a, a twist ending and a cap off to this story as we could think. And, and uh, we're all, pretty pleased with that particular you ending. What you eat. Yeah, and it's uh, it pretty much just solidifies uh, the campy attitude of uh, a face eater and uh, uh, 
I think it's it, it's a fun movie. It always was designed to be a fun movie. You know, we weren't going for an Oscar. We were going for fun, and I think we succeeded. I think uh, everybody worked very well as a team. I think our policy of having people do their best but not get too caught up in themselves and, and leave their egos at home uh, worked to create uh, an amazing uh, low-budget independent film. And um, it's hard to imagine being more proud of uh, accomplishing something like this than I am of our film face here. Yeah, it's, it's been an amazing experience. Uh, like I've said repeatedly, um, we couldn't have done this without the support of our friends and family and uh, without the help of, of everyone involved. And um, if, we, if we didn't have that, uh, we wouldn't have a movie, I believe. So uh, again, I'd like to thank everybody involved in the, in the process. And uh, we certainly hope something comes of it someday. I feel the same way. Uh, we're both very grateful to everybody that took part. Uh, the credits are lengthy because many people did. Everybody got paid equally, which was nothing. And uh, if this film gets played periodically um, and finds a place in the subculture known as cult film or, or uh, anything that is considered campy or fun, then it was well worth it and I'll consider our efforts a success. We thank you for joining us on this commentary and hope you enjoyed it and uh, hope you uh, watch Face Eater with your friends again if you've already seen it. We'll see you at the movies. Get out of here! <laughs>